So good morning, everybody. It's a real a pleasure to be here in China, the birthplace of so many of the amazing students and colleagues I've worked with throughout my career. So this morning, I actually want to tell you a, a story of a major scientific discovery uh, in which MIT has played a leading role uh, over many decades. And this is the discovery uh, of gravitational waves, which are, are quoted to be a way of opening a new window into the universe. So before I can tell you about the new window into the universe, I actually have to tell you what the old window was. And the old window into the universe was light. For millennia, humans have observed the universe with light, with, through our own eyes and then in increasingly with powerful instruments. So here is one of my favorite pictures in astronomy. And this is actually a picture it's of a supernova remnant. So what this object is, is actually a star, a star very much like our own sun, that at the end of its life, when it ran out of nuclear fuel, it has no longer has light pressure that pushes out and holds it up against its own gravity. So it implodes, and as it implodes, there's a shock wave that sends out all this material. And the colors that you see are also quite important. It's, it shows the importance of measuring with different colors of light because the, the sort of the reddish colors you see is infrared or low energy photons. The green and yellow colors are visible photons like our own eyes could see. And then the blue and purple colors are actually using X-ray emission, some very highly energetic photons. Now, if you look very carefully at this image, at the very center, you will see a little blue dot. Does everybody see the little blue dot? Good. This little blue dot is only visible in the X-ray, and it is the new star that was born when this old star exploded. It is called a neutron star, and it's the most peculiar object you might imagine, because it has the mass of our sun, but it actually is only 10 kilometers in radius. Now, let me put that into comparison. Our sun has a radius of 700,000 kilometers. So this is an extremely compact object with lots and lots of mass packed into a tiny volume, which means it's gravitationally very, very, very strong. This is a neutron star. Now, if this parent star that exploded uh, had been a little bit heavier than our sun, maybe three times the mass of our sun or heavier, instead of forming this neutron star, this little central object would have continued to collapse due to its own gravity, and it would have turned into a black hole. So neutron stars and black holes are cousins of each other with one important difference. When the black hole forms, it has so much gra mass and such a small volume, its gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape, hence the name black hole. So you might ask this question, how might we directly observe black holes since they are black and our traditional messenger of astronomy, light, does not carry the, the message. And there enters the new messenger, and this is the messenger of gravity. Since we know that these objects have a lot of gravitation, could we do something useful with gravity? And the answer came to us when in, uh, from Albert Einstein in the early 20th century when Einstein in 1916 gave us a new way of understanding gravity. Instead of thinking of gravity as forces between objects that have mass, Einstein told us gravity is geometry. Ge geometry of what? Of space-time itself. And so the picture Einstein drew for us was that if you think about empty space as just a sheet, you can think of it as a rubber sheet if you like, and if you put a massive object in the, in, somewhere on that rubber sheet, it will deform, very much like if you put a bowling ball on a cushion. And then if you put a smaller object in, uh, near in that region of curved space-time, or in the analogy of the cushion and the bowling ball, if you put a playing marble at the edge, the playing marble will fall towards the bowling ball because of the curvature of the cushion. And in analogy, he said, well, these, the, 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 the small object, the Earth around the sun, for example, would have to follow the curvature of the space-time created by the massive object. Now, Einstein asked another question. He said, well, what if this massive object, in this case, you know, drawn in this picture as a star, what if it wasn't just sitting still? What if it was actually moving, accelerating? And in that case, he came up with this idea that he actually had a lot of trouble accepting himself, which was that the entire space-time would ripple. 
And that was the introduction of gravitational waves, which is that when you have massive objects in space that are accelerating, as the, as the case of maybe these two neutron stars in orbit around each other, the space-time itself would ripple, and those ripples, those waves would spread out and spread into the universe and carry information about this system, information that is purely gravitational. No light involved in this picture so far. Now, Einstein was very pessimistic about this idea because in his time, he understood that these waves are too faint, and he actually said they're too faint to ever be useful. That was the, what he said to us in 1916. Now, that's because in Einstein's time, we didn't know about neutron stars and black holes, which are gravitationally very strong objects. We only knew about stars like our own sun, which are not as gravitationally strong. Now, by the 1960s and 70s, after the discovery of neutron stars and, and black holes, this man, Kip Thorne, professor at Caltech, told us, well, yes, they're faint, and he actually calculated what the amplitude of the wave would be, and he gave it a number. And this number turned out to be 10 to the minus 21, which is a, a, a decimal point with 20 zeros after it before you put a one. So it was a small number. Confirmed Einstein's pessimism. This is a pretty, these are pretty faint. At the same time, also in the 60s and 70s, this man, Ray Weiss, who's a professor at MIT, said, well, that's OK. We should still be able to detect them if we can figure out how to measure changes in distance or motions of objects that are 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, let me just put into, uh, into context, a motion of 10 to the minus 18 meters is a 1,000 times smaller than a single proton. Weiss told us in 1972, well, that's OK. We can figure this out. We'll make it work. And he actually wrote a paper in which he showed how to do this. And from that work, Weiss and Thorne met in 1975 and was born the experiment that is called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO is, has to do two things to make this measurement. The first thing it has to do is what the measurement itself that's being made is, so here's a nice toy of an interferometer on the top right. And basically, my animation isn't working, but that's OK. I can work without it. Good. So this interferometer here basically takes a laser beam and splits it into two beams. One goes up, uh, up to the top, and one goes to the right, reflects off mirrors. And when those two light beams come back together, they can either add up or subtract. And through that process, we can measure the light at the output and tell what the position of those mirrors is. That's easy. That was known even at the turn of the 20th century. What's difficult is that these mirrors, when that gravitational wave with amplitude 10 to the minus 21 comes by, it will move those mirrors by 10 to the minus 18 meters. So the job in LIGO was to keep the mirrors very, very still compared to all the forces on the Earth, and then to measure that small motion. And that was the, that was the technological challenges of LIGO that was done through very sophisticated vibration isolation systems to make the mirrors very still. And then to actually measure the positions of the mirrors, we use laser light. We use lots and lots of photons, very powerful lasers. So we average over the fluctuations of the lasers themselves. And I want to actually just tie in a little bit to Professor Pan's talk. When you make a measurement at this precision of you know, a thousandth the size of a proton, quantum mechanics really matters. And some of the technologies we use in LIGO are shared with the technologies that are used in quantum information systems. So, that's a, a nice uh, tie-in. This was all built in, un, with funding from the National Science Foundation over many uh, decades. And a third pl uh, a person was important in that, and that was this man, Barry Barish, who was seen as the person who, uh, who led the collaboration to build these instruments. The three of them were recognized for a Nobel Prize uh, last year and uh, in, in, uh, shared between Weiss, Thorn, and Barish for the discovery that I'm about to describe to you. So now we fast forward to 2006, where for the first time we are able to solve the equations Einstein wrote down about space-time variations, about these gravitational waves. So here is a, a simulation where I will show you two black holes. These black holes are orbiting each other. And as they orbit each other, they're giving off gravitational waves. Now notice that when, you're, when, you're, uh, when they're far apart, they each have their funnels underneath them. But as they orbit and those gravitational waves carry away energy, 
their orbits are going to shrink. They're going to get closer and closer to each other. And as they do, their funnels will start to interact. And space time will become extremely warped and, and very, very um, 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 dis distorted, if you will. And so that's the, the, the mountains that are, are, are forming in this space time. Notice that it's getting more and more um, um, warped. And then eventually the movie will, will slow down and stop when the two uh, black holes collide. And if you look at the bottom, you've seen this sinusoidal signal accumulate, which will have its maximum when the two black holes have collided. And then the two black holes will merge into one single black hole. They'll wobble a little bit, and then the signal will shut off and these pink and blue gravitational waves propagate into the universe. Okay, and this is actually a movie that's built on an exact uh, a, a calculation using Einstein's equations that has only been enabled in the past decade or more uh, through the uh, availability of, of very powerful computers. And then fast forward a little bit more, uh, 10 years later, in, in September 2015, the LIGO detectors detected for the first time gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes. The, what you see on the screen here is actually the bumps and wiggles of space-time itself. Every peak and trough you see was space-time peaking and troughing. Okay? And now what you notice is that in those 200 milliseconds in which this signal was measured, the maximum of the signal occurs at, uh, when the gravitational wave amplitude was 10 to the minus 21. Big check mark for Kip Thorne. He told us that in 1968. The amount by which the mirrors of LIGO moved when this signal was, was measured uh, was a few times 10 to the minus 18 meters. It's a big check mark for Ray Weiss. He told us how to do that in 1972. And then we could tell from the, all the, the different components of the signal, we could tell that these two black holes were about 30 times the mass of our sun. When they collided, you must pay attention to this because it is the most bizarre thing you might hear today. When they collided, these two black holes, 30 times the mass of our sun, were moving at half the speed of light. Okay, so it's an extremely relativistic system, 1.3 billion light years away. And we also know that the new black hole that was formed was not as heavy as the two black holes that collided, and three times the mass of our sun was radiated away as gravitational wave energy in those 200 milliseconds. So very, very powerful explosion that we could not see in any other way except by its gravity, its gravitational waves, because the system is dark otherwise. Now fast forward another two years, and we saw the first collision of neutron stars. Uh, and here you see two neutron stars colliding. And when neutron stars collide, they actually fuse heavy elements. So you see a lot of light as well. So this is an artist rendition, but what you see is after the collision, you see this big cloud of material where heavy elements are being fused. And this object, when it, uh, it was observed by LIGO, was shortly after, that same night, over 70 telescopes worldwide pointed at this object and saw the light coming out of it. So for the first time, not only did we see an object with its gravity, but we could also see it with its light. And we learned remarkable things about this first system in doing that. So let me end by, by telling you that this is a, a worldwide uh, uh, effort. The two US detectors are LIGO in the United States. There's also a detector in, in, in in Europe called Virgo, which is three kilometers long. LIGO is four kilometers long. The longer they are, the more sensitive these instruments are. And then you can see there is a network of, of detectors uh, that both operating or about to come into operation, including a planned observatory in space called LISA. And I'll just put out there, since I'm here in China today, that this is actually a, 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 a scientific opportunity that maybe the Chinese should also get involved in. And that there are efforts here to do that. So, so, uh, so uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put that out there. So let me end by telling you why you should be excited. So we've discovered these gravitational waves that Einstein told us about 100 years ago. We've seen for the first time that black holes appear in pairs and they collide. We've seen neutron stars collide. And in that collision, we have seen the fusion of heavy elements like gold and platinum. But really, is that what we'll remember 100 years from now? And let me make an argument for how we might think about it. So we believe Galileo was the first person to point a telescope in the sky about 400 years ago. And 
Most people don't remember what Galileo saw because even a toy store telescope today is more powerful than what Galileo's telescope was. But Galileo did something very, very important. He made a paradigm shift in how humans observe the universe. We could use instruments for the first time, not just our naked eye. And since then, we've built an amazing array of instruments, including turning on instruments with wavelengths of light that our eyes couldn't see. And that has led to all the discoveries that we know in astronomy today. And I predict that this is where we are with, Gal with gravitational wave observatories. We are at Galileo's telescope. And what the next decades and centuries bring, who knows? But it's going to be an exciting ride. So thank you for being here and for, for listening. <laughs>